how to improve self-image and eliminate self-doubt. Let me begin by asking a question. Who do you see as the ideal person? Who do you secretly admire? Is it someone like Beyonce? She has the shape you long for, the money. She has the fame, loved all over the world, celebrated, millions of followers on social media. She has a beautiful family. Her husband, Jay-Z, is a multimillionaire. They have three beautiful kids. And I'm just using Beyonce as an example, a real example, based on today's society. And I dare tell you today, you do not know her struggles. You do not know the struggles of the people you admire the most. I can tell you in the last 100 years, over 100 young, beautiful, very rich people committed suicide. People who, in today's language, made it at a very tender age. People like actress Marilyn Monroe, the very definition of beauty and money and fame. She was even having an affair with President JFK, committed suicide at the age of 36. Musician Kurt Cobain shot himself dead at the age of 27. Lucy Gordon, who acted Spider-Man 3, hanged herself at the age of 28. I am not celebrating these deaths. I'm trying to say this. I'm giving you just an example to tell you you don't know people's struggles. You might be admiring others and you don't admire yourself simply because you don't know their pains. You don't know their story. You don't know their thoughts. You don't know their real struggles. How do you know you struggle with self-doubt and poor self-image? It's possible to be in church right now and live in delusion. What's that? Delusion is self Deception. Keep thinking that I'm all right. This message, Pastor, I know who you're targeting. And they, I wish they came to church. But it's unfortunate they are still at home. There may be many factors. Let me throw some 10 key pointers of someone struggling with low self-esteem, poor self-image, and self-doubt. One, poor self-confidence. Doubting your personal competencies, capacity, talents, and gifts. Number two, self-criticism. Talking yourself down. In an attempt to attack the problem, you end up attacking yourself. You are both the attacker and the attacked. You say to yourself things you can't even tell people you don't like. If you told your friends what you tell yourself, you would never have one friend. Number three, addictions. Overindulging in self-destructive behaviors. Habits that are slowly ruining your life. Four, avoiding limelight. And I'm not suggesting by any stretch of the imagination that everybody needs to be on stage. No. But I'm saying if you're trying to hide in shades, in shadows, behind the scenes. You don't want to be spotted. Chances are you're not comfortable in your own skin. You're not confident with yourself. Number five, identifying yourself with your own struggles. Calling yourself things like, I'm fat, I'm obese, I'm drunk, I'm a smoker. No, you're not a smoker. You are giving yourself false identity. Nobody was born drunk. Nobody was born a smoker. That's a title you're giving yourself, and by so doing, you empower what you don't like. I'll never forget in 2017, my Marcy and I were going to London to speak, and there is a lady who came to me, and I, was, I, I felt very honored. She was one of the gold medalists, a marathon gold medalist. She came to me and Say, Doc, I've been listening to your videos. I'm so blessed by your videos. I felt very honored. And I didn't know that the team knew me. And she told me they were just discussing me. There were a couple of them going for the London 
champion, athletic championships. And then I asked her, can I ask you one question? Yes. Is it true that the last couple of days before you run the marathon, you actually practice every day? You do the marathon, the 42 kilometers every day. She told me, no, we do it twice a day. How on earth can you run 42 kilometers twice a day? She told me, I am a runner. And that settled it. The same way when you say, I am a smoker, that becomes your identity. She simply gave, so when she says, I am a runner, I understood everything. That's her identity. What's your identity? How do you identify yourself? What picture do you keep seeing before you day and night? How do you know you have self-doubt and poor self-image? Number six, anxiety about the future. You're always nervous about tomorrow. You're feeling like things will fall apart. Number seven, the feeling of losing control. Like you're losing control of yourself, your relationships, your career, your business. Like things are falling apart. Number eight, indecisiveness. Inability to make decisions quickly is an indication you don't trust your choices. You live in self-doubt. There are people who can only make a decision when someone else makes a decision to leave the job, to leave the neighborhood, to leave the church. You ride on other people's choices. Number eight, self-rejection. Not appreciating yourself. Lack of self-acceptance. The question is this, at what point do you think you'll be comfortable with your body, with your finances? When will you have enough? You've got to realize this. That self-image is not a destination. You will never arrive at it. You've got to question yourself. Who defines your beauty? Who defines how good you are? Who defines how well you're doing? Have you bought into a fake image projected by the media? Who is your source of authority? That's a question you must ask yourself because self-image is not a destination. You will never arrive at it someday. Your net worth is not your self-worth. We've got to draw a line between your self-worth and possessions and your external looks. What image you keep seeing yourself every day. You must learn to love yourself unconditionally. Nothing to do with your money, nothing to do with your career, nothing to do with your weight. You must learn to accept yourself unconditionally. Don't put any conditions to self-love. Number 10, not accepting compliments. People tell you you're looking good, you struggle to receive compliments. Then that is an evidence you're living in self-doubt. What causes self-doubt and poor self-image? There could be many, many causes. I will discuss three critical ones in my opinion. Number one, people cause self-doubt. Especially words spoken to us by our parents and early educators. For example, you failed a math test, you went home, and your dad or someone important to you, your mom said, you are a failure, you are a loser, you amount to nothing. That begins to paint a mental picture of how you see yourself. Or a husband tells you you're ugly. The one who is supposed to be your lover tells you you're ugly. Or he doesn't tell his son or his daughter they are looking good. It is the responsibility of the father to call the man out of his son. It is the responsibility of a father to call the woman out of the daughter unless it's a single parent family. So when a woman, for example, is never told by the husband, you're looking good, you're looking beautiful, she begins to doubt her beauty. She begins to doubt herself. Unless someone in the course of life makes you see another worldview. They make you believe now you don't have to hear those words, those negative words from those who spoke you down when you were growing up. 
David said, I'll encourage myself in the Lord. I don't have to wait for others. In Psalms 56, 11, David said, I will put my trust in God. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? In other words, I will not allow anyone to destroy me. I will not empower anyone to grab my identity. Our very first parents, Adam and Eve, I'll use them as an example. Eve went to pick some apples or some oranges or some grapes. I don't know why so many people think it's an apple. It could have been any fruit. And unfortunately, she began to listen to the voice of the enemy. Did God really say? The enemy always comes to make you doubt yourself and to doubt what God said. Genesis 3.1. Did God really say you're beautiful? Did God really say you can launch that institute? Did God really say you can get a college degree? Did God really say you're created in his image? The most beautiful thing ever made? Did God really say you are fearfully and wonderfully made? The enemy comes to make you doubt yourself and to throw aspersions on the credibility of God. But God came to them and said, Who told you that you are naked? Genesis 3.11 Who have you been listening to? You didn't have clothes before you met this enemy. Because God comes to cover our shame. God does not come to embarrass us. Who told you that you're not beautiful? Who told you that you're poor? Who told you that you're a loser? Who told you that you're a failure? This is a question God is asking you right now. Who have you been listening to? You've got to be careful with who speaks into your life. Not just here in church, but on your day-to-day -day life. Even the videos you listen. Number two, what causes self-doubt and poor self-image? Number two, our personal experiences, especially past mistakes, past failures. Far too many people, if they start a business and fail once or twice, they throw in the towel and conclude, I am not wired for business. If they go for a performance, say musical, or an audition, and the judge does not pick them up, they conclude, I was not born to sing. There are people who get into a relationship. They are hot ones. They are hot the second time. They give up on relationships. They give up on marriage. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16, though a righteous man falls seven times, they rise again. They never give up. The righteous never give up. They never sign defeat. They keep trying and trying until there is a breakthrough. One CEO firing you up does not mean you are a non-performer. There are countless employers out there. One college rejecting your admission does not mean you don't have academic prowess. There are thousands of colleges out there. One boyfriend rejecting you does not present 3.5 billion men on earth. You are taking the wrong sample. We are so many of us here who believe in you. Why are you believing a lie? The third cause of low self-esteem, low self-doubt, low self-image is comparisons. Comparing ourselves with our peers, especially our former high school mates, our former college mates, or the guys we met in our first job. You know, the first salary was very exciting. Then you try to check what type of a woman did they get? What type of a car do they drive? What type of a husband? Is their husband a doctor? Is he rich? Which neighborhood do they live? The question is this. Must you look better than someone else for you to look good? Must you have more money than someone else for you to be comfortable in your own skin? You see, we live in a very competitive society that has introduced the concept of above average. So as your pastor, if I come and tell you, you are an average doctor, you are an average teacher, 
you are an average entrepreneur. You are an average singer. The guys who are singing here right now, if I told them the, the singing today was average, some of them will never come to church again. We always want to hear we are above average. I'm an ab above average singer, above average student, above average husband, above average architect. I just don't draw buildings. I'm an above average preacher. I don't just preach average sermons. Let me tell you, this is a deception from the enemy. First of all, it's illogical from an academic perspective. If there is a line called average, then 50% must be below average. Why do you want to hear you are above average? It is the competitive society we live in that tries to suggest to you you are better than others. And I'm bringing you back to the word of God. You don't have to compete with anyone for you to feel good about yourself. Can I tell you, I believe with all my heart, this is the greatest message ever preached. Whether you believe it or not, in it, that's up to you. And next Sunday will be better than today. That's my personal conviction. Why? What should bother me is that tomorrow I should be better than yesterday. Not what someone else is doing. The Apostle Paul writes, Hebrews 12.1, there is the focus on the race set before you. Not a race, but the race. Your race is not my race. What you should be concerned is not running faster than others. You don't need to be on the fast track. You only need to focus on your race. And to always ensure that today you are better than yesterday, not better than your siblings. That's what is causing sibling rivalry in your home. You're trying to outdo who has more apartments, who has more money, whose children are in the Ivy League's university. Stop that nonsense. And start focusing, am I better today than I was yesterday? I tell you before God, my master knows I have very few friends, less than three. And she can tell you this. Since she met me, I'm always focused on my goals. What concerns me? Not how others are doing. There will always be someone ahead of you. There will always be someone behind you. The question is, are you getting ahead of where you were yesterday? I want to give you an eight-step procedure quickly on how to improve self-image and eliminate self-doubt. Some eight steps. Number one, always dress sharp. Always dress sharp. I know this is very easy on Sunday morning. It's never a problem. I am saying after church, don't dress down and we are funny. Because when you pass through your house mirror, always ensure the picture you see is good. This message is especially important to women. Because you seriously dress down. <laughs> yeah. You come in my house in the afternoon, I'll look the same way. Half of these ladies will look totally different. Does that make sense? And I'm suggesting, and don't be shy, look at me on my eye. Even your inner wears, make sure they're looking good. Because every time you, st you go to the bathrooms more than us, for reasons God knows. And you are always... Let's be, let's be real here. And you're always on the mirror more than we do, more than men. So imagine when your inner wears are not looking good, and you're always there looking at your butt, you're seeing something funny. I am suggesting today, always look sharp because that's the image that gets in your mind over and over again. When you look sharp, you become confident in your own skin. There are jobs you lose, there are contracts you lose, there are deals you lose based on how you dress. People tend to judge you by how they see you. How you dress reflects how you respect your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. You are always in the presence of God. Look good, whether it's your sleeping clothes or your bathroom clothes. Always dress up. Why? I repeat, this is the picture you keep seeing. What we are seeing here in church is for a few moments. This is for us. This one you did for us. 
What happens behind the scenes is what you do for yourself. So be sharp. Remove all those campaign t-shirts from your wardrobe. Number two, focus on your strengths. A lot of people focus on their struggles. A lot of people focus on their weaknesses. Not realizing whatever you focus on expands. You are already weak in your weaknesses. Stop working on your weaknesses and work on your strengths. And that will overcome your weaknesses. Begin magnifying your strengths. Whatever you focus on expands. The magnifying lens should be on what you like, not what you do not like. Because everybody has faults. Don't focus on your weaknesses and your faults. The Bible says we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 All of us have fallen short of the standards of God. Why are you so harsh with yourself? Always criticizing yourself. I want you to know your pastor and anyone else you admire, we all have faults. We all have something we don't like about ourselves. Physically, spiritually, emotionally, we have a historical baggage, all of us, in every area of our lives. We have fallen short of the expectations and the standards of God. Begin to celebrate your strengths. Number three, engage in social activities. Let me break it down for you. Today afternoon, go out for a dance and let people start cheering you. Vera, 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 woo! Yeah, let them cheer you up. Be on the spotlight. Go for a musical gig. Go for boring. And now we start talking about you, Doug. Hey, Doug, go, go, go. Doug, you have no clue how much I have seen you improve since you started playing guitar and singing in this church. Every time you are put on the public limelight, it boosts your self-confidence. It boosts your self-esteem because you know you're needed. You know the service you're offering is needed by others. You are celebrated by others. The more you hide there, the more you hide your talents, the more you destroy your gifts. Get out for some outdoor activities. Go out for hiking. Have some fun out there. Mix with people. Don't isolate yourself. Don't be lonely. Loneliness breeds hopelessness. Isolation leads to depression. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise. Proverbs 13, 20. Hang out with the like-minded buddies. Never be alone. Number four. And by the way, when you are alone, that's when the enemy plants seeds of self-doubt. And you know we like hiding behind our phones and gadgets and staying late until three in the morning. That's the time the enemy speaks to you a lot. If you are laughing with other people, You'll be surprised by how much they see the beauty in you. Step number four. Practice self-affirmation. Widely recognized by many people as the greatest boxer of all times. Muhammad Ali used to say, I am the greatest. Maybe this contributed to him winning in the ring. Self-affirmations. I'm the most beautiful girl since life spread. Speak with no apologies. I'm the most handsome guy since the world began. I am the most favored of the father. I am the head and never the tail. I'm always on top and never below. Self-affirmations. I dare you right now. I want to give you some homework for this weekend. Pick some five sticky notes. Five sticky notes. Write something about yourself. I love myself because I have always made the right relational choices. I love myself because I finally graduated with a college degree. I love myself because I am in control of my emotions. Five sticky notes. Hang them around your room. And the first one should be about your body image. That's where it begins. I love myself because I have fair skin. 
If you don't celebrate yourself, no one else will. Why apologize for celebrating yourself? Jesus never apologized for his identity. From the beginning to the end of his career, the enemy only attacked one thing, who he was. His personal view about himself. They said, we are not killing you for the good. Jesus asked them, which of these good works are you killing me for now? We are not killing you for any of the good works. We are killing you for your identity. What you said about yourself. Let me remind you, how did Jesus launch his ministry? Right at the launch of his ministry, the devil tempted him about who he was. If you are the son of God, three times. At the end of his other ministry, on the cross, the enemy tempted him on the same thing. He spoke using the mouth of the soldiers. If you are the son of God, come out of the cross. Destroy the salvation plan. Come down here. The question was his identity. That's what the enemy attacks. If the enemy can make you doubt yourself, you are defeated. So Jesus, with no apologies, spoke like this. I am the bread of life. I am the gate to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the life and the resurrection. I am the son of man. I am the son of God. With no apologies. So much so that the Bible says, if we don't believe that, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot, cannot deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 Your opinion is immaterial. Jesus cannot deny who he is. And that should be your start. You should never deny yourself on account of what others think. Humility is not denying your strengths. Humility is not denying yourself. Humility is acknowledging the strengths of others. Have no apology. Speak like Muhammad Ali. I am the greatest. Or like R. Kelly. I am the lion in the jungle. I am a nigger. I am the river. I am the mountain. I am the star. I know some people don't like that. They think it's pride. So if you don't like it, go call yourself a maluza. I'm the ultimate failure. What alternative do you want? Would you rather we say you are a failure, a loser? I think the best example is to follow the example of Jesus. Don't deny who you are, but celebrate others. And be a team player. That does not make you feel like an only fish in the pod. No. You still have to work with others. The ultimate man, Jesus Christ, decided to work with others. He said it is his pleasure to give unto us the kingdom. He, he transferred what he had into 12 others. And he told them to keep doing the same. All authority in heaven and on earth is given unto me. I got it from my father. Matthew 28, 19. I give it to you. Give it to others. Make disciples of all nations. Transfer it to others. That is the concept of Jesus. Because he's secure. Because God's power is limitless. It's infinite. You can't deplete him. So he says, Frida, you have received. Frida, give. And everyone you convert and make them a disciple, let them do the same. Let's have a multiplier effect. Number five, mind your own business. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, mind your own business. Stop being bothered with other people's marriages. Stop being bothered with other people's cars. Stop being bothered with how other people are doing in their business or in their career. Mind your own business. Focus on your own business. The word business here is not trade. It's everything about your life. Like coming to church is part of your business. What you cook in your house is part of your business. I think you're too quiet on me. Just tell someone near you, mind your own business. Hey, you don't like my lipstick? Mind your own business. You don't like my ring? Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Number six, master your work. The Bible gives the answer to everything. And the Lord tells us, whatever your heart fights to do, do it with all your might. 
No divided attention. Do it with all your might. How you may ask. Persistence and repetition. If music is your thing, do it with all your might. If real estate is your thing, tomorrow morning, knock 15 doors. Make 100 calls. Do it like there is no tomorrow. Malcolm Gradwell suggested the 10,000 hour rule. That if you want to master a craft, you need to do something over and over again, 10,000 hours. I was trying to do some quick computations. Do some math with me if you can. Eight hours a day, five days a week. How many hours? Simple maths. 40 hours. Let's take 50 weeks, not 52. Let's assume you rest for only two weeks. 50 weeks in a year times 40, give me 2,000. Simple maths. 10,000 hours divided by 2,000, you're very guys. Five years to master a craft. Five years. If you're only taking two weeks break. Bruce Lee said, I don't fear the guy who has practiced 10,000 kicks. I fear the guy who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. That kick can knock me dead. Doing the same thing, whether you're seeing results or not. Over and over again, 20 years later, Dr. Gauzy, let people know I am a doctor. 20 years later, Christine, let people know you're in the music world. But the moment you admire something else and keep shifting gears, to be everywhere is to be nowhere. Keep, keep doing it over and over and over again. That way you master. How is this related to self-image? Let me tell you, the moment you master a craft, you become an expert, people begin looking for you. you it boosts your self-confidence. It's a very simple fact. When you know you're needed, when you know you're wanted, when you know people are looking for you, your self-confidence goes above the roof. I know it. I know how many people look for me because they're looking for a personal coach or for executive coaching for their company or they want me to speak. I'll be in Las Vegas tomorrow. When people are looking for you, it changes all dynamics. It's just a fact of life. It boosts your self-image and your self-confidence. So if all you do is bodybuilding and you're helping people gain shape, do it until the whole world knows you. They see you, they see Mr. Health or Miss Health. Whatever you hard advice to do, do it with all your might. Charles, not papers for the sake of it. You can have a PhD and never make impact. It's a question of doing something until you master it. Jesus did not want to know any other business. He stayed on his lane from beginning to the end. He explained his mission right from the desert. He opened the scroll of Isaiah as recorded in Luke 418, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Here is my assignment. He has anointed me for what? To preach the gospel to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To open the blind eyes. To unstoop the deaf ears. To make the lame whole. To cleanse the lepers. To cast out demons. To pronounce the exalted ear of the Lord. He stayed true to that cause. He is the greatest blood of all times. Three years without deviating from his mission. If you master one craft, people will look for you. You will be known as the expert in your field. And that will change how you look at yourself. Number seven. Receive and give compliments. When people say you are handsome, I know this is difficult for men. Learn to receive it. Ladies, when somebody says you're beautiful, I know you're used to that since you were a kid. For some reason, women have heard this. So I challenge you if you're a parent, go tell your son today you are handsome. Boys have grown deprived of those words without hearing those words from anybody. Go tell your son that. My son is in this service. Ask him if you want. I tell him almost every day. If he thinks I'm a funny person, that's okay. 
I would rather come out as a funny dad. Because I don't expect anyone else to affirm him. If I can't do it, who will? I call the beauty in my daughter Ivy daily, not some days, daily. By the way, I do it also on mercy every day. I picked it up from where the parents left. And now, now I'm challenging you, learn to receive and also to give compliments. When you tell other people they are looking good, you begin looking at the good in them. You stop, you stop seeing their faults and their weaknesses. And you begin seeing their strengths. That's what the Bible says. First Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Love never spoken is not love. Love must be spoken. Love must be expressed. Your thoughts don't bless anybody. And the moment you compliment other people, it makes you see the beauty in them. And it also makes you see the beauty in yourself. It takes a secure person to tell others, you're doing good. I like your car. I like your outfit. I love the music this morning. It takes a secure person to compliment others. You have to be on a higher ground to raise others up. It takes someone to be low to pull others down. You must be living in a pit to be able to pull others down. Number eight on the last step, have an eternal focus. With all due respect, nobody in Ukraine right now is thinking about how beautiful they are or how rich they are. When you come so close to death, all you think about is saving your own life and the life of your loved ones. Some of the issues we magnify are so petty simply because we lack an eternal focus. Somebody calls you a name and you make a mountain out of that molehill because of having such a temporal view of life. That's why you are asked over and over again matters, values, and priorities. Live today as though it was your last day in life and you will have the right perspective. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 2, looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, though God in flesh, what made him to endure the shame, the embarrassment, the pain on the cross, rejection by the Father, rejection by his disciples, rejection by everyone, no one has been more rejected. On that cross, Jesus was the ultimate reject, the ultimate curse, the ultimate poverty, the ultimate adultery, the ultimate theft. He didn't become a thief, he became theft. He became poor that we might be rich. He became a curse that we may be blessed of God. He was rejected. The Bible says what kept his sanity, he looked beyond the cross. At Gethsemane, when he saw the cross and what he's going to go through, he said his spirit was so crushed to the point of death, he began sweating blood. That's a lesson for another day. But what kept him mentally alert, what made him not to lose it, the Bible says he set his eye on what was before him, the joy before him. That's my charge for you. If you can set your eye on eternal values, on what our Father has in store for us, you will not be overbothered by temporal criticism, by people who try to tear you down, especially relatives and colleagues at work. It is people closest to us who are the most mean with us. In the name of love, they come and tell you something nasty. My parting shot. Hell is the ultimate self-hate. Heaven is the ultimate self-love. Were you blessed by this message? Are you blessed by my ministry? I would like to invite you to be my ministry partner 
by sending me your love offering every month. I've shared with you the giving options on the screen. Help me to spread the gospel around the world. And remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to hit the bell to get notified whenever I upload new videos. And if you're visiting the Atlanta Metropolis or you live around the Atlanta area, welcome to Family Church, 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia.